Begin, okay. Uh, Carla should run the meeting until you elect the chairperson. Oh, I thought that came after the approval of the agenda. Okay. It's a different order, it's just an organizational meeting. All right. So, Let's see if your batteries. You know, I, <laughs> I needed, to, yeah. Bill, I needed to take a minute and make a statement. Well, is that okay, or do we? I think you, Carla needs to call the meeting to okay. order, All right. and then she can yep. get the agenda approved. Okay. And then that's not until after. That's not until. Oh, right. All right. So I will call the meeting of the select board to order on March nineteenth at seven p.m. The first order of business is to approve the agenda. I will make the motion to approve the agenda. So under consent agenda items, it's actually the minutes of the February 23rd meeting that need approval. Okay. So uh, are we doing the entire consent no, agenda just items just the to move it? Right now. Okay. I'll second then with the change. So are we approving this agenda? Is that what I'm hearing? That's what Unless you have is, something yeah. you wish to. I, I do. Um, uh, Charlie O'Brien brought me down his uh, um, uh, Force Fire Warden uh, re up sheet and needs signatures by the board and I'd like to add that to the list. Okay. Anything else? So, all those in favor of the agenda as amended, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Next order of business is select board organization. First order of business being to elect a chair. And you can, if you want to speak, you can speak before. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Um, so before we get any further into this, I'd like to uh, make a couple of statements. Um, a year ago, you people elected me as chair. Um, I worked hard to uh, try to represent you um, the best that I could, being first time around. Um, this last town meeting, however, uh, I feel like I kind of tossed that all in the in the dumper. I um, made the insinuation that or statement that uh, Jane was from Mars uh, during that meeting the beginning of the meeting, and I wanted to form formally apologize to her. Um, it was an attempt at uh, light humor, but uh, it's obvious I'm no George Woodard. <laughs> um, so for that, I wanted to apologize, and I can assure you that uh, from now on, I will stick to the platform um, and save my jokes for when I'm with my friends. And I also wanted to apologize to the board and any other staff that was up on stage if they felt uncomfortable at the time. Um, I apologize for that. And uh, moving forward, if uh, you, if tonight you don't reappoint me as uh, chair, I would uh, totally understand that and, and be okay with it. So with that, I'd move on. So I'll take nominations for chair of the select board for the ensuing year. I'll nominate Mark Mater. <clears throat> I'll second. I'm afraid I will have to respectfully decline that. Um, my schedule just really doesn't afford that. I uh, would certainly be interested in the vice chair position if that were uh, to your liking. Um, but I would have to defer on the chair position. I'll nominate Chris Fiennes for chair. I'll 
Sakata. <coughs> Are there any other nominations? Can the public I, No. I'd nominate Jane Brown, yeah. but I, yeah. <laughs> so if there's, if there's multiple, out there. no, no, if there's multiple nominations, then you'll have to, it'll have to be seconded and then you can write who you choose on a piece of paper and Carla will look at them. So you can nominate more than one person before you vote. So there's been a motion and a second to nominate Chris. There's been a motion to nominate Jane. There hasn't been a second yet. So that's not an official nomination yet. Do I hear a second? I will second that. Do I hear any other nominations? If there being none, we will have a vote. One name <clears throat> on it. Make sure. Does everybody get the paper? Yeah. I already have mine. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. And then hand it to Carla. The votes are three to two in favor of Chris Vans. So now you can take over, you can take over, right? Yep. Can I say something? Sure. I'd just like to say, I guess it's tit for tat. <laughs> Don't you know that men are from Mars and women are from Venus? <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I'm no George Ward. Learned that. <laughs> Okay, I got that weight off my shoulders. Uh, <laughs> we can move forward. Um, so the uh, agenda has been approved and the next thing on the list is uh, conflict of interest. No, no, no. you're elected vice chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Take nominations. Yep. Each one is separate here, so, yep. So we'll elect the vice chair then. Is there any nominations? I'll nominate Mark Mateo. I'll second. Any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of having Mark Mateo uh, vice chair for the ensuing year, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> okay, next is uh, secretary. Are there any nominations for secretary? I'll nominate Carla Lawrence. I can't, I can't do that. It has to be a board member. Oh, a board member. All right. But you don't have to do anything. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll nominate uh, <laughs> Jane Brown as secretary. I'll second. It is the secretary, too. <laughs> Take notes when it's if, yeah, if somebody's not. Okay. I was secretary last year, and I, I think, and I didn't do anything. Sounds <laughs> good. Are there any other nominations? 
Seeing none, all those in favor of having Jane Brown secretary for the ensuing year, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. Now we can move forward. <laughs> Consider a conflict of interest policy bill. I forwarded Was it? So the conflict of interest policy has been forwarded to you uh, last week in your packet. Um, I think it's plain on its face what it is. Um, the state does um, ask towns to have conflict of interest policies. Uh, most often we are asked about them and to show them when we're being audited for a grant that we uh, may have taken with federal or state money. Um, but it's a, it's a best practice. This is based on a model policy that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has drafted. Most municipalities adopt something just like this or very close to just like this. This is the same policy that the board has adopted for the last couple of years. I believe it hasn't changed, right? Correct. So I would recommend that the board adopt the conflict of interest policy. Clearly, I hope you've read it. Um, if you have questions about it, this is the time to talk about it. But it's it's your policy. It's not it's not staff's policy. It's uh, your policy, and it each board in the community um, adopts this type of policy. So the trustees adopt it. The water sewer commissioners just adopted it this afternoon at their meeting. <clears throat> so is there a motion to adopt the conflict of interest policy that Bill has presented tonight? So moved. I'll second that. Motion been made and seconded. Uh, any other discussions? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, next is consider rules of procedure. I found the stuff to sign. So they, you've got to sign this. So just you can continue, but just pass that along and sign it. <clears throat> you want to explain the rules of procedure? So I also forwarded to you in your packet on Friday the select board rules of procedure. Hopefully you glanced at it. This is the same. These are the same rules that have been in effect for several years and basically show you how to conduct your meeting. Okay, if uh, everybody's read the rules of procedure, um, somebody would like to make a motion to adopt those? Uh, I will move that we uh, adopt the rules of procedure as currently presented. For a second. I'll second that. Motions have been made and seconded. Um, are there any further questions? Comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So next is uh, discuss procedure for signing the warrants. Uh, for Matt, this is uh, new information. For the rest of you, it's the same information that we've uh, passed along every year now for probably 10 years now at least. Um, there are warrant orders that have to be signed by the select board uh, in order for bills to be paid. So uh, when vendors send bills or contractors send bills to us, um, staff prepares for the bookkeeper and expense code directs which uh, line item in the budget gets charged for that expense, and then the bookkeeper uh, processes those bills and at the same time produces a warrant, a listing of all the checks and to whom they are written and in what amount. Um, until the legislature passed the current law, which is probably more than 10 years ago now, uh, it required a majority of the legislative body to sign those warrants. So uh, the, the, the weeks that we pay our bills and we pay payroll weekly right now uh, have for as long as we've been paying bills. Um, and it used to be that at the nights that we had select board meetings or 
trustees meetings for the village or water department meetings, um, the warrant order would be brought to the meeting and the select board would pass it around and sign it. Um, it really should have, in those days, taken a motion. It was kind of just understood that it would be reviewed and, and signed. On the weeks there was no meeting, um, we'd have to have three select board members at least come in and sign it. And again, it should have been a meeting, uh, but it kind of was, okay, we're just gonna come in, and as long as three people signed it, it's okay. And that procedure was happening widely across the state where select board legislative bodies were not really always holding a meeting when they considered the warrant orders. So the legislature, um, with um, um, encouragement from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, passed a law that said, rather than require a meeting for the warrant orders to be signed, the select board could make a motion and authorize any or all of its members to sign for the full board. Um, as long as that law has been in existence, the Waterbury boards have passed a motion to allow one of their members to sign. And um, I think the first year that we did it, they, they, the board designated a couple of different people. Then of course, if somebody goes on vacation and somebody gets sick, that doesn't work. So of late, the board has been nominating all of its members uh, to, to do it. And then once a week, someone comes in and Mark can explain the process because he's been one of the faithful ones. He and Doug Schneider used to do it alternately. So anyway, a motion should be made if you want to take advantage of this provision of the law that allows one of you to sign, you need to make a motion to authorize that, uh, that to happen. Okay, so then I'd look for a motion to uh, authorize any one of the select board members to uh, sign warrants when needed uh, throughout the year. So moved. Or a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further questions? I would like to make the statement that uh, my wife has, uh, now that she is retired, I am uh, up for grabs to uh, participate in that <laughs> uh, warrant signing. Uh, all I ask is that uh, if I'm going to do it, uh, if we could do it before my busy season, which is in a month or so. So, What, uh, what Don and I had worked out was basically a month-to-month -month rotation. So one of us would take it for a month and one for another month. So whatever works out best for your schedule, we can we can plot that in. And Nat, I don't know uh, what your availability might be, but I'm I'm happy to um, hold the bicycle upright while you uh, while you work on that. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. So uh, motion was made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Appointments and committees. Looks like a uh, newspaper uh, of choice is up. Uh, Addy, do you want to? Well, no. it's, you don't have to. It's, this is uh, your, your choice. So the, the law requires a municipality to designate a newspaper of record, uh, even though we are well into the digital age. Um, we are required to put notices in a newspaper that circulates regularly in the community. Um, we have found that um, for the purposes of what we need to do, um, a weekly paper works, uh, and the, uh, the advertising rates in the Waterbury Record are far more favorable than some of the daily papers. So staff's recommendation would be to designate the Waterbury Record as the newspaper of record. Uh, and then if you do that, we'll have a suggestion for an alternate as well. I'll make a motion to designate the Waterbury Record as the newspaper of record. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 It's helpful though to have a, um, 
a daily as an alternate. Uh, the Times Argus for years was our paper of record before there was such a thing as the Waterbury record. Um, very rarely nowadays, it, but there are times when something comes up, uh, it's a little bit of a, uh, I won't say a surprise, but it, uh, maybe a grant application um, comes to the attention of staff and we need to get some information into the paper about that. So uh, we've recommended that the Times Argus be the alternate paper of record which would allow us, if necessary, to very quickly get the notice into a paper that circulates, um, well, it's five days a week now that that paper circulates. And uh, we would, staff would recommend that you designate the um, Times Argus as an alternate. I'll make a motion for the Barrytown Times Argus to be the alternate. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> all right. Consent agenda item. No. Missing one? Yeah. You got more on the committees? Right. So okay. between now and the end of April, we'll be looking for volunteers for all of our volunteer committees, like the Planning Commission and DRB and Recreation Committee and that sort of thing. Um, so we will be advertising for those positions and typically. I think there may be openings on just about all of them. So typically I notify the, can the current committee members if their term is up, and then we also, to see if they have interest in re-upping, and I'll also be advertising them uh, probably in the front porch forum and the library record and on our website. So just to let you know that that will be in process and we'll be making appointments towards the end of April. You will be making appointments towards the end of <laughs> April. Yeah, a number of years ago, the board uh, moved and the committee appointments basically take effect they, uh, May 1st and serve until April. And it gives us time to advertise. Uh, back in the day, we used to try to, at this meeting, appoint everybody to the committees. And it just was a little bit difficult to do, given everything else that we have to do. The other thing that you should um, just understand is that there is currently a vacancy on the Library Commission. Um, there was a, a resignation from the board last year. Um, there were two positions up, one full five-year term that someone ran for, right? right? So the full five-year term, uh, there was a candidate and that person was elected at a town meeting. But there is an unexpired term that needs to be filled. So the library directors are in process now of uh, seeking someone to fill that position, but that the state law requires that the legislative body of the town make appointments to vacancies on any elected board. So even though it's an elected library commission, uh, they're going to beat the bushes, try to find somebody, but there'll be a recommendation to the select board to uh, make that appointment. Um, and it, it's up to the board, the select board, to do that if you don't agree with their recommendation, you can say no, that hardly ever happens. I won't say it never happened, but <laughs> hardly ever happens. So do we need a, a motion? <clears throat> no. No. Yeah. All right. Um, where did you want to squeeze in the thing for Charlie? His uh, reappointment form. Oh, now it's fine. Okay. We're under appointments. So Charlie O'Brien is the forest fire warden here in town and his uh, reappointment is up for the ensuing year. And uh, he dropped this off at my place tonight um, for signatures from the select board. If uh, somebody wants to make a motion to approve his uh, reappointment form. Chris, is there a term on there? Uh, July 1st, here. 2018 to June 30th, 2023. Yep. Five years. Five years. To June 30th. June 30th, 2023. Excellent. And what's the start date? July 1st. July 1st, 2018. Okay. I'll make a motion to uh, approve Charlie O'Brien to continue as the uh, town fire warden. With the dates that are on the application. 
I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve Charlie O'Brien for Forest Fire Warden for the next five years. Any further questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items. Uh, looks like the uh, first one is minutes of February 12th meeting and March 6th meeting. And then liquor licenses for uh, Village Market, Cabot, and the Reservoir, Champlain Farms, Fast Stop, Old Stagecoach Inn, Bluestone, uh, Stowe Street Cafe, Jimmy's Pizza, Zen Barn, Blush Hill Country Club. And then, uh, Chris, it's the minutes of the February 23rd meeting. What's I, that? It's minutes from February 23rd. Oh, yeah, I got the fifth. I use a February typo. February 12th. Okay, uh, excuse me. <laughs> typo. <laughs> All right, and then the last thing on the consent agenda items is uh, approve the E911 private road name um, for Lassiter's Lane. Yep. That's right above the old Jaime Myers farm there, just as you're crossing the bridge on Loomis Hill around the corner. Uh, the lower side of the road, there's a stretch that's been a new road that's been put out there that services four lots, I believe, th at least three, and uh, the fourth being the remaining 16 acres, and uh, Do you wanna and I believe the, the existing no, barn. These all have to be signed. So, if somebody'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I'll second that. So just, <clears throat> excuse me, just before you vote again for Matt's benefit, um, the, uh, the select board uh, acts as the liquor control board for the town. Uh, that's by state law. And um, this is the time of year where liquor licenses get uh, renewed by April May 30th. First, April 30th, May 1st. Okay. Um, so they, they come in there'll probably be more down the line. Um, there's information on here that the applicants are required to uh, submit. Uh, it's generally a pro forma um, signing. We pass them around, but I do want you to know that you know there's things that you should look at here. And if you pass the consent agenda now, um, that's indicating that you're all gonna that you're gonna sign this. So you you have two choices. You can leave it on the consent agenda, and <coughs> you're basically saying there's no issues with this. Or you take it off the consent agenda, let it circulate, let people look at it, and if there's questions, you can ask them, and you can make a motion to sign it independently. So. Um, back when we kind of changed the format um, to come up with a consent agenda item list, uh, it was my understanding that it were it was items that were of not much of a deal, big deal. Uh, in yeah. So, in, in are you advising us that we should be looking at these? No. All, all, I'm, all I'm saying is, you know, uh, we put it on the consent agenda. That's normally where this has been. Um, I didn't think about it until just now. That's a new person, and I just want him to understand and the rest of the board that if you approve the consent agenda. There's no ability to not approve these. The Department of Liquor Control is the ultimate mm -hmm. um, permit issuer, and the board is simply recommending. So I, I'm just letting you know if you want to take it off the consent agenda, you can do that. We can pass it around. So I, I guess, Chris, to your point, if we had thought about it a little harder, we probably wouldn't have put it on the consent agenda. Yeah, OK. So with that being said, um, is there any reason that the board would like to pull those from the consent agenda for the time being, to have time to review them, or are you comfortable with the fact that well, they're Well, uh, from my perspective, these were existing licenses anyway. Uh, these are renewals, and 
again with uh, uh, the oversight of the uh, Liquor Control Board uh, itself, um, I, I think we're in good shape with handling these on the consent, consent agenda item tonight. Um, my sense is that when we have new applicants or if there's a, a one that has had a history of problematic um, uh, behaviors that we would want to take that separately. Yeah. Okay. okay. I feel like I ask this every year, but do I need to pull myself out of this or do I just not sign mine, but can I still approve the consent agenda items? Just not. Or do I need to just recuse myself from the Oh, you're not on, you're not on, oh yes, you yeah. are on the yeah. list. I, I would, I would, yeah. I would completely recuse myself if I were. Okay, I'll recu recuse myself. All right. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if everybody wants to, uh, the motion's been made and seconded. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items, please say aye. 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 Thanks. So these need to be signed by the board. Okay. For some reason tonight seems to be a, a delayed meeting, but uh, we're finally getting to the public. Does the public wish to say anything? Alyssa, come on up. Start with Mark. Oh no, he recused himself. <laughs> I'll be quick with the upcoming um, public informational meeting for the Route 100 Rehabilitation Project. Um, Barb and Laura Pratt and myself and Karen. Anyway, we're doing public outreach. I've distributed like 35 of these today to the businesses on Route 100. I wanted to make sure you all, staff, anyone else who wanted them. This is your WaterburyWorks.com orange construction stress cone <laughs> for the next couple of years. Um, the website is live. Go check it out. There's contact us. I'm on there. If there's issues, let me know. But I'll get a stress cone um, and check it out. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. I got letters of free puppy. You could get two. No, I'm just kidding. Now to uh, follow up on that a bit, Alyssa, I was given instructions to offer the reminder that uh, the informational meeting is uh, uh, what the Wednesday night in Stowe. Six p.m. Stowe Public Safety Building. Is that it? Yeah, that was all. I just want to make sure you all got one. Thank you. Check Thank you. Yep. Where's where's all that Stowe? Any more safety building? Or anybody else had the wish to speak this time? Seeing none, we can move on. Um, discuss and identify board, board priorities for the coming year. So this this is on the agenda just to uh, to let you all know that you have to do this. Um, <laughs> you, you don't necessarily have to identify everything that you want to do tonight. Maybe there's nothing that you want to talk about tonight to put on this list, but you know we've been through town meeting, we have the budget, and staff now will take that budget and try to execute it and do the things that you folks or the, the prior board decided to put into the into the budget and that the voters approved. So we as staff have our marching orders in terms of what we need to do to effectively uh, execute what the, the town has directed us to do. So our highway programs, our recreation programs, those things are things that we'll be working on. But there are other things more policy related. I'm going to talk about a couple of the ones that we have been working on when we get to the manager's items in a little bit. But, um, you know, this is a time for you as select board members, as individual select board members, to offer to your colleagues, I think we should begin to look at this. Or, you know, we've got a capital improvement plan. I'd like to know more about it. I'd like to <clears throat> flesh it out a little bit more, direct staff to do things like that. So this is really meant as an opportunity for you as a board right now to just have a brief discussion or a long discussion. But um, staff won't be coming with any initiatives really at this point 
at least that I can, that I'm already on the list here. So if there's things that you want staff to do to prepare for next town meeting, at some point you need to let us know, preferably before, you know, two weeks before you ask us to do it. February 12th. Yeah. yeah. Right. <clears throat> Well, I just would like to stay focused on paving, culvert improvements, um, transportation, bicycle and pedestrian improvements, um, taking advantage of grant grants as we've been doing for Colbyville. Um, even that is, is very expensive when you look what it's going to cost over five or six construction seasons. But I think it's important not to let that go, to, to stay uh, focused on pedestrian improvements as well. Uh, we did a lot of talking during the budget process this year about paving, and we um, <clears throat> put aside that bridge construction for a few years because it seemed like there was some, some life left in that bridge. And um, I think that was the right decision to make. So. We have a lot of uh, paving needs, and I don't know. I, I I think that we need to also consider the um, feasibility someday of um, revising our charter if we need to look at um, the local options tax. I don't think we're ready to do that yet, but I'm I'm just concerned that we may have no we may have no choice. Um. I'd like to follow up on that a little bit. I think um, uh, the question regarding uh, development of a charter for the town, the, the village has operated under a charter for a number of years, and now with the current uh, revision uh, to establish the uh, utility district, um, I think it's, it's probably something uh, of interest uh, not only uh, with community members, but of interest for us as a governing body to um, uh, to look at some of the um, advantages of, of having a charter. That being said, it's uh, my understanding is it's a, a fairly lengthy process, and it's certainly a process that we're going to want to engage uh, the public with. Um, so if we do. Uh, decide to explore that, we'll probably be looking at establishing a committee of one sort or another, um, gathering information and then being able to share information much, much in the same format as we used with the police question last year. Um, the local option tax piece, um, again, that is something that um, we discussed last year. It had been discussed in, in prior years. Um, there, there appears to be a level of interest there, certainly something worth bringing before the community for a larger discussion. A um, uh, number of communities around the state have taken advantage of it to various degrees. There, there are uh, different variations of that that could be implemented, but again, that, uh, that ties in with getting uh, valuable feedback from, uh, from the community um, in any effort that we want to move forward on. The other two items that I just wanted to uh, throw out for discussion and consideration are more business related. And although they can be tied in with the charter, my understanding from conversation with Bill is that it doesn't necessarily require a charter uh, language is the the prospect of adopting a uh, fiscal year that, uh, that runs in alignment with uh, the state fiscal year. Um, my, my interest in that is that it gives us the opportunity to uh, vote on our budget before we actually get into expending our budget. Uh, the way we work now, um, we go from January into March before the voters have had the opportunity to uh, even consider or, or approve the budget. Um, by transitioning to the fiscal year, we have that vote and discussion in March. Um, and then when we hit the start of the fiscal year, we've, we've got the budget already discussed and approved. Um, 
Another feature that I was looking at kind of related to that was looking at how we, we collect our, our tax payments, the tax installments. Um, a number of communities have gone to quarterly installments. Um, that does a couple of different things. One is that it, it levels out the income flow for uh, the town government. So we're not in a position of, of having to borrow um, in advance of tax receipts. Um, but it also, um, from my line of thought, lessens the burden somewhat on the taxpayers. Instead of having to come up with those two sizable payments in relatively quick succession at the end of the year, we're able to spread that out over, over the course of the year through quarters. Um, it's it's uh, something that I've heard some measure of discussion on, but again, those sort of things may well dovetail with a community discussion of the charter. Um, just to get the feedback from, from the larger community and, uh, and to help guide us in decision making. Bill? Yeah, <clears throat> so just to uh, clarify for the board, um, the, the charter is something that uh, really, if you want to consider the local option tax, having a charter is really the way to accomplish that. There's been some discussion that you could petition the legislature directly for that. I think that's a much heavier lift than having a charter that says it. Um, the, the fact that you put it in the charter doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have it. There are, are communities that have passed a charter that enables them to enact the local option tax, but then uh, the local option tax is actually triggered if the legislative body um, has a, a vote and then the town votes to do it. So it, it can be a two-step process where you get it in the charter that the legislature has given you the permission to do it, but it only happens if there's a vote. So uh, that's getting down the pike a little bit too far on that. And I'm not advocating for or against a, a local option tax. I'm just saying that if you want to consider that, it's better to do it through the charter process. The second um, part that Mark talked about, and I explained this to him the other day when, we, when he talked to me about this, um, <clears throat> municipalities already are enabled to move to a July 1st fiscal year through the general laws of the state it would require a meeting, article at a town meeting or a special town meeting, and the town would have to vote to do that. But you don't need a charter to move your fiscal year. The, the state law already says the select board can want a town meeting to ask the voters that question, or the voters could petition for a town meeting. But uh, that would be the same process as I described about uh, Australian ballot for, for public questions. Um, you already have that right in state law to vote by Australian ballot. It simply takes a vote at town meeting to say beginning the next town meeting we're going to do that. So you don't need a charter for the second um, thing that Mark talked about, which is changing the fiscal year. Um, you really do need to have a changed fiscal year if you're going to try to have quarterly tax payments. Um, the law is clear right now that you cannot send tax payments until you have an approved budget. Uh, we don't have an approved budget until April. We get the grin list lodged to us by our listers in June. We set a tax rate in July. So the earliest right now that we can collect taxes is about when we're doing it, in the middle to end of August, is as early as we can do it. You could have 10 payments between August and December if you wanted to, but that's a little impractical. But if you did want to go to quarterly, or even there are, I think there's one town that may actually bill monthly for taxes, I think that's a little bit overbearing, and we don't need that. 
but you would have to change the fiscal year if you want to affect anything other than what we do now for tax collection. So can you touch a little bit on the, um, the, the uh, process in which changing from fiscal or changing to fiscal, is there a double overlap in, in taxation at some so, point? So <laughs> there's a couple ways to do it. <clears throat> uh, most towns, when they vote to change their fiscal year to a July fiscal year, so let's, let's say at town meeting this year we voted to, to do that. Um, we would have voted a budget that that would carry us from to the end of December, just like we always do. But at ne next town meeting, we would prepare either an 18-month budget that would take us from January 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020, or we would prepare two budgets, a six-month budget and a 12-month budget. Most towns that move to a July 1st fiscal year adopt an 18-month budget. And just like it is now, that first budget that you would adopt, would you would be adopting it, you know, seven weeks, 10 weeks, whatever, into the, into the year, you'd have until June, I mean, uh, April um, 7th or whatever it is to petition for an overturn. But that first 18-month budget would be adopted within the budget year, just like we do now for our 12-month budget. And then it would run until June 30th of the following year. And then at the next town meeting, uh, your year wouldn't be ended yet. You would be, you would be, uh, your annual report would show the last budget that was adopted, the last year that ended, the current year that you're in now wouldn't show at all. There might be a projection column. Most towns don't show projections anymore because you're projecting something that could really be off by the end of the year and it confuses people. Um, so you'd move to a situation where you'd be preparing your budget um, you know, we'd start preparing our budget in December, which is, you know, five months after the year just started. Uh, you'd be using projected numbers to say, okay, it looks like we're going to be here, and you'd put, a get, put together a budget that's going to start in, in July. So uh, most towns, I shouldn't say most, most of the bigger communities in the state have definitely moved to this uh, July fiscal year. A lot of the small towns have done so too. Duxbury did a couple of years ago. They moved to a July 1st year. Um, <clears throat> from the perspective of staff, uh, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. There's the way that I do the budget now because I've been around so long and have a good feel for it. Uh, I. I enjoy the fact that I have the year-end numbers and I know, except for those postbacks that I talked to you about, I know what we spent last year. And, you know, you're in the, you're, you're developing a budget for the year that you're in and you only have to project out until 12 months later. So I think you can be more exact than uh, you can be when you're doing a budget on a fiscal year basis. There's a lot more projecting, both of the year-end numbers, and then you've got to, you know, you're preparing a budget in, in December and January of this year that's not going to end for 18 months from the time that you're preparing the budget. So the budgets are not as exact. But we're not really in a time period any longer where we're ending up with fund balances that we're trying to have close to zero. We still do that with our operating budgets. I try to budget to a zero fund balance, but we got a million dollars in reserve funds that we can worry about or not worry about that we can fall back on if we need it. So it's, it's not as urgent as it used to be when I first started my career to have exact numbers. Um, it's very confusing to a lot of people, especially people who come from other places who don't understand. What do you mean? You, you know, uh, we're adopting a budget today and 
you're telling me that we can't eliminate this budget completely. No, you can't because we've already spent two months worth of it before the meeting even started. So you've got to at least appropriate what we've spent already. So uh, I think for that reason, um, it, it's a little clearer to everyone that you're passing a budget that you want to uh, uh, put in place as opposed to that you're already spending and, and have restricted choices. Well, maybe just on that particular issue alone, we could have either a good portion of a meeting or sure. a meeting, depending on how long it takes to go through the pros and cons of both. You know, I got some concerns on the fiscal aspect of uh, trying to predict out uh, that far ahead and whether or not there's going to be any issues of you know, uh, complications financially of you know what are the what are the odds of making bigger mistakes uh, budgeting out that far um, and what benefits you know we have now based on the current system so just to jump back real quick um, going from calendar to fiscal the first budget would be basically instead of going from calendar to calendar like we do now we'd be going from fiscal to fiscal but in order to phase into that, we would basically be going from calendar, beginning of the calendar, to the end of the following fiscal. Right. So that, that first year, that pretty typically now when towns move to a July 1st year, they adopt an 18-month budget at their, their town meeting, which is the last one that they'll be adopting anything already in their budget cycle. And as far as the local options tax, um, certainly can have that conversation. Now, um, you may be able to shed some light on it as to how that conversation would go at some point. I would think the public would want to be in on that. Yeah, I think all of these things, you, you, you need, you're going to need the public because um, you're either going to need the public on the fiscal year change, you're either going to need the public to approve that at a town meeting, or you're going to need the public to approve the charter that you write that, that has that in it. Um, and then as far as local option taxes, when you get to the point, or if you ever get to the point where you decide that you want to do it, you're going to need voter approval. So uh, I think they're, they're, they're two different Things. The, the changing of the fiscal year um, certainly can wait until, you know, you can charge the, if you're going to appoint a committee to study the pros and cons of having a charter, um, or if you want to appoint a committee and tell them we want you to write a charter because we think we should have it, you can allow the charter committee to address the fiscal year issue and, and have that come to fruition at the end of the charter process. Or if it's something that, you know, the, the charter process, I'm going to say, you know, at the, it's, it's already, uh, you know, the last part of March. And if you started the charter process right away, you might be ready to vote on a charter next town meeting, but that that would be a pretty big lift, I think. Um, it, it can be done. Uh, I'm not saying that it can't. But if you don't put the committee together until, say, July, you won't, I don't think you'll have the ability to have a charter to vote on next town meeting. So if you want the fiscal year stuff to happen faster, well, the fastest way you could do that is to call a special town meeting and ask the voters to uh, approve taking advantage of Title 24, whatever the section is, that allows you to have a July 1st fiscal year. And then at next town meeting, we would, we would vote on, on that 18-month budget. But you have to have the one before the other. You, you can't just show up at town meeting next year and present an 18-month budget. You'll have to have the voters tell you they want to change the fiscal year to authorize you to do that. Then you would come with the budget. So either way, you need the public to approve this process. 
Yeah, part of the uh, motivation for bringing this up is that these discussions have gone on for a couple of years now, and we're still probably two years out from being able to realize anything if, in fact, uh, we, we do go down this path. So uh, for, for us to continue to have the conversation about, oh, that'd be interesting to look at, and then not make any progress on it. So I, I think um, I, I would certainly be interested in starting to get the ball rolling on it and whether or not we split out um, the fiscal year uh, <coughs> question from the rest of it. But I think um, the informational outreach, um, we may be able to combine the two as far as some preliminary education goes and then try to move um, uh, one of the questions ahead of the other because it seems like the, the charter is more complicated from the standpoint that it not only has to be approved by our voters, it has to be approved by the legislature. Right. So we're, we're talking a timing and sequence thing. And there's a lot of examples of charters out there. There are towns that have very complex charters, and there are other towns that have, you know, we operate under the state, the general laws of the state of Vermont, except for, and they have a couple of exceptions. You know, they might, well, it used to be you had to uh, have a charter if you wanted to appoint your town clerk as opposed to electing the town clerk like the state law says. The legislature a couple of years ago has made that enabling legislation in the Green Book. So towns now can just put that on the ballot. Shall the town uh, authorize the select board to appoint the, the clerk? And they can do that if they want. It used to take a charter to do that. So the legislature has, we've tried to encourage the legislature. When I say we, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns have tried to encourage the legislature to say, if you've passed a charter for any municipality to do anything extraneous of the general law, you should enable any town to, to do that. Why should they have to go through the charter process if you've held hearings and everything else and say it's okay for Stowe to do this, this, and this, why couldn't Waterbury simply take advantage of that? Uh, they haven't quite got there yet. Uh, it's a little, they, have their government operations committee and they need something to do. So um, I think that the other thing that you need to, I, I think, um, acknowledge if you go down the charter route, and I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I mean, we voted on a charter, uh, I think it's six times since I've been here, and it's Every one of the merger documents that was, was voted upon was actually, if it had been approved, would have been the charter of the town of Waterbury. So we have had charter votes in the past, kind of disguised as merger votes only, but those were all charters that the town would have had. Mm -hmm. So there's information in the building about what the community has looked at for charters. But if you go down the charter route, the other thing I think you need to acknowledge will happen is there will be people that will use the charter as a means to advocate for Australian balloting. Uh, and again, you don't need a charter to go the Australian ballot route. You can, somebody can put a petition in now. You'd have to call a special town meeting and if they voted to decide public questions by Australian ballot, that's what we would do. You don't need a charter to do that. But I think if you do have a charter discussion, that will be something that comes up. So the way I understand it now. Jane, yeah. you wish to say something? Or are you past that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I had a question. Um, thank you for asking. I, I, I guess uh, in, in a way I favor if we were to explore the charter option, the one that you mentioned, Bill, where you could um, Make a change in the chart. Make a charter so that it's it could it could happen to have a local option. Yeah, because I don't think we're, I think it's a lightning rod issue, and I don't think we're quite ready. We're quite there yet. It just seemed to me that it may, it it, it may be a good idea to get the a charter so that you could make it happen later. Yeah, and I think um, so. You're I th closer. I think that that two two step process, adopting a charter to enable it, and then voting 
to enact it. Mm -hmm. I think that really has been a result of some of the discussions the legislature has had with communities where, you know, people say, look, you know, I'm in favor of having a charter. I like all these provisions of the charter. I like what we're trying to do to govern ourselves. I'm not really sure I favor the local option tax, and I'm kind of being forced to vote no on the whole charter if I don't want the local option tax. So in response to that kind of criticism, uh, towns have written charters where they say, uh, we have yeah. the ability to have a local option tax if the voters approve it at a separate and independent okay. yeah, vote. I, I guess and the legislature has uh, encouraged that. I, I had a question too. You mentioned the Australian ballot. So do I understand that um, if you go to Australian ballot, you don't have any town meeting? You only vote? Um, you don't have both? Mostly yes, but. <laughs> so uh, the... Um, Municipalities that have voted to vote their public questions or their budgets by Australian ballot uh, are required to have a public information meeting <clears throat> around the time of the budget vote or the, the election. So the unified school district, the night before town meeting, when we all voted on the school budget, mm -hmm. they held their um, their information meeting. And at that meeting, uh, there were about 15 people that attended, which is bigger than has been in the recent past. I've been the only person there a number of times. Mm. But this time, there were about 15 people there. And the 15 people there voted on certain things that were not related to the budget. So they voted on appointing a clerk to the board. Yeah. They voted on uh, directing the school directors to hire a, a CPA to audit the books. Um, those kind of things. So more administrative. But, right. And then there was discussion about the budget. So mm -hmm. I had some questions about the budget. I asked the questions. The board and the business manager answered the questions. And I said, thank you very much and sat down. But I didn't get to vote on the budget until the next day at Australian ballot. So you have to have a public information meeting. The challenge is that people typically don't come out to those public information meetings because they really can't do anything of importance. They might be able to ask a question about the budget, and they might have a comment that the, that the board thinks is particularly interesting. But the board has already adopted the budget that's going to be set before the voters. So that question that gets asked at that open public information meeting might be the best question they've ever heard, but it's too late to do anything about it. You've got to vote the next day. And you can only vote yes or no. You can't, you can't write X, yes, but please cut $20,000 out. You know, it's, it's just yeah. an up or down vote. So, uh, you know, if you read the, uh, I, there were a lot of questions on front porch form about this, and I wrote something, and it's posted on our website. And uh, you know, what I said was that moving to Australian ballot really requires people to attend select board meetings a lot more frequently than they typically do, and they typically don't even in that case. So I, I you know. I think we lose a lot, and it's just my personal opinion. I like town meeting. I've always felt that I try to educate myself to the point where I'm comfortable answering any question that anybody asks. They might not like the answer, but I'll have an answer for them, and the board will have an answer for them. And But, you know, we amended our budget the other day, um, and, and we did that a few years ago with the recreation director, you know, add money to make a full-time recreation director. And you can't do that through yeah. Australian ballot. So were you able to, did you uh, catch his letter that he wrote? Uh, there's a link yeah. on the website. You should really take the time. Yeah. To, it, it was 
very informational, very helpful. Okay. Very helpful. Yeah. So uh, I missed it. Yeah, and I think that so would answer the a, lot of, a lot of your questions. Still too. There, right? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, great article. Um, I tried to encourage him to put on the paper, but <laughs> he's, still, he's still working on that. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other comments, Mark? Yeah, I mean, um, just getting back to other uh, board priorities, I, I would like to have a discussion on an understanding on how the water and sewer system is going to be governed and a, a better understanding of how we can work with that group because I feel like in the past um, some maybe development opportunities or just a feeling that there was this fight for annexation to the village before properties could be considered for water sewer and just understanding how that will be working moving forward and just making sure that um, there are ways that we can work with that board to continue the growth of that system. I think that's an important thing moving forward. And I felt like the two governing bodies really made it difficult for that to grow. So I'm just interested in understanding that. Um, I also, I, I, don't, I think we've talked about it in the past and I'm kind of blanking on it a little bit, but just the um, TIF districts and what options we might have on that. I know in the, like right in the fourth quarter last year, we talked a couple times about maybe making moves on different properties for parking and other questions on how we would pay for things like that or sewer system expansion or other things and, and wanting to know if that is a an option and then again does a charter need to be in place for something like that so just an understanding of that um, so briefly on the TIF districts that stands for tax increment finance district and um, there is a provision in the state law that allows municipalities to, um, to, to create a TIF district and the development, the new development that happens in that district, um, the uh, statewide education tax on that new, new development is deferred. The state doesn't take that into the education fund and the money is, I'm not sure if it's all the money, but the municipality gets the full tax base of the new uh, property. And typically the revenue that comes from that TIF district to the municipality is used by the municipality to pay for the infrastructure that they may have had to invest in. So if they had to build a road or if they had to build a, a water line into a, a new place to allow that development. Um, the, you don't need a charter to have a TIF district. You do have to vote to have a TIF district. Uh, the legislature has uh, put a cap on the number of TIF districts, so it's very difficult to get, um, to get in there. Uh, a year ago, there was a, a lawyer who was sending you know, email broadcasts to many, if not all, municipalities asking for them to help lobby for uh, broadening the number of districts available. Vermont League of Cities and Towns have been at, very active in trying to get the legislature, again, to say, you know, if a TIF, TIF district is good, let more communities do it. Uh, of course, the downside from the legislature's perspective is if everybody created a TIF district and all this new development was excluded from the education fund, how would we fund education? So there's this push-pull. What's, what's the period of time? on? Like, it's not I, forever, right? No, it's not yeah. forever, and, and I don't know, Mark. The other thing is that um, the, the fact that the village has is in the process of dissolving um, is an opportunity perhaps that the TIF district could be looked at again. Um, back, Sue Minter was still in the legislature at the time, but there was some discussion by her and others in the community about the TIF district and whether it was something Waterbury should um, consider. And you know, um, we were still waiting for Main Street reconstruction at that point. We're still waiting now. But the, the complicating factor was the village. Um, the water and the sewer in particular is in the village. Um, who was going to get to use the tax base? Was it the village or the town? 
Um, you know, the village would be the one with the water and sewer system investing there. So it was very complicated when we looked at it initially. Uh, now that the village is on its way to becoming the utility district, uh, the village will still have the authority to collect uh, ad valorem property taxes, but they, they won't have any budget to support that, that uh, property taxes will need to support. So they will not be collecting taxes. The only reason why their authority to collect taxes is being left in their charter is that in case they don't collect enough revenue to pay their water and sewer bonds, they could tax the grant list of the utility district to make that payment, but it's a very unlikely scenario. So the fact that the village won't be collecting taxes any longer is a little makes it a little bit easier to deal with the TIF district, but it's it's a heavy lift. And right now, the legislature is um, they haven't. I don't think they approved any new TIF districts last year. Milton was Bennington. Uh, Wasn't there maybe, one with Bennington? There was a, a big hoo ha yeah, over that. So. Is there a period of time that that expires? Because I know Montpelier got it, and I know they're planning on it, doing some it's, pretty it's big. It's out infrastructure. there. I think it's like ten years. It it may be a little bit more or less than that. But uh, last year, um, at the league's select board orientation, they had a presenter that was. <coughs> talking about that kind of stuff. And they showed um, that over, over a span of years, that, um, uh, that sacrifice to the education fund is more than made up for by uh, the, the grand list increase that, that comes along afterwards. So their selling point was, yeah, it, it uh, pinches the education um, fund a little bit now, but ultimately, uh, once you get beyond that period of the TIF designation, you've got the next 100 years of um, increased grant list that's uh, going to be working to your advantage. So that was their, their sales pitch on that. When I went to the Capitol Plaza, um, they talked about it was an economic development uh, seminar, and uh, TIF was talked about to some extent. Um, they, the formula basically uh, consists of, you know, municipalities borrowing money to improve infrastructure in a designated area. But the, the component that makes TIF work is that you have to have everything from soup to nuts in place, uh, really, before they emphasize that you have all that in place before you attempt to move forward with something like that because they gave an example of one municipality who attempted such a, a such a venture and um, halfway through the project after the town had invested substantial amounts of money uh, the economy went south and uh, the developers and whoever the investors whoever were supposed to follow suit afterwards didn't and uh, they were left hanging with a pretty substantial bill, no way to pay it other than reaching into the taxpayer's pocket. So they suggested that, you know, the whole process be in place and solid before you move forward with something like that because there's a fairly high level of risk involved. Um, is, there, is there incentive from a developer in any way for TIF? Like, what's the incentive from a developer other than maybe new infrastructure? Is there anything? There's nothing on a. So basically, if I we're. I think the development, I think the, the end property taxpayer ends up paying the same tax that they would have otherwise. Right, so paid. there's no. It's just directing the tax to a different place. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think sometimes what's in it for the developer is that in some communities, um, the only entry into getting this infrastructure work done is if you finance it through the TIF, because they, they're wanting the, 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 the new developers to be the ones paying for that project as opposed to the existing users. So um, I think for, I don't know if there's a lot of opposition to TIFs by developers, because as I said, they're going to pay the same 
tax that they would have paid otherwise. But sometimes I think it may open an opportunity in a particular community for them that would otherwise be reluctant to make the infrastructure investment necessary to allow that development to happen. So, so I haven't heard from Matt yet. If he has anything, are you all set? Or well, I think you have uh, something else? I think we shouldn't forget uh, the police moving forward and making sure that we're remembering that this is only a three-year contract that we're looking at doing. And um, you know. I know we've put together the committee, but just starting to get things in order more for a Waterbury-based police force, I think it's something that I think we know we're starting to go towards, and I think it's an important to, to not forget that and, and get ahead of it and start making those plans. Matt? Um, first and foremost, I'm going I'm to focus on absorbing <laughs> all of what I'm hearing. Um, but, you know, the things that are most important to me um, going forward here are, are keeping our eyeball on, um, keeping our eyeball on affordability in this town. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of roads that need a lot of work. Um, so I agree with Jane in that uh, paving is a, is a huge, is a huge, um, thing that we need to keep focused on um, and um, I'm also interested in seeing this uh, this police venture um, work for us because I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us um, and um, you know going forward if, you know a few of the things that I uh, was a just a reoccurring theme in, in a lot of different DRB meetings was parking 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 Park. And this is going to become even more of a huge issue, um, especially when downtown starts getting ripped up. Um, I'm very, very interested in seeing uh, what kind of solutions we can come up with um, to, you know, back when I came to this town 20 years ago, um, downtown really wasn't a very nice looking place. You know, there were a lot of empty stores and, and you know, uh, it, what it is today, completely built out, vibrant, shops full of customers. We got a lot of great businesses downtown. It's, it's a hop in place. We've got some issues. You know, we've got, some, we've got to keep our eye on the ball here. So those are the things that, hot button issues for me, I guess. Okay. You all set, Mr. Mateer? All right. I want to I add one more thing, too. I think recreation is something that I want to keep on the, the front of our minds, too. I think, you know, I know we're starting to put together a committee to look at the future of the pool and just how recreation could look and, and more of a maybe the idea of a community center. But I just think that recreation is such an important part of the community that's here. And I think we've done, we made vast improvements by getting a full time recreation person on board, but I just want to continue to look at different options that can keep the locals excited about being here and then also ways that, you know, Stowe has that recreation path and I think we have an amazing mountain bike trail system here in town and I just think that there's potentially more we could be doing there that, um, you know, I want to make sure that we continue to support. I agree. Thanks for bringing that up. Ever. I don't need to go to the mic if you want me to have um, I think Ann would prefer you did, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Your button green, is it? There you go. Back several months ago, uh, and I haven't heard anything tonight on it. Chain mentioned the paving. But uh, something that should be prioritized, in my opinion, in the opinion of people on Manuski Street and other areas of the community, is what are your plans for improving, replacing, repairing many of the sidewalks, maybe by sections or certain blocks or whatever. But uh, as I mentioned that night, and Bill and I didn't necessarily totally agree, his comment was there's no money for it. And I'm interested in how much money was put in for sidewalks for this coming summer. 
I heard from one of the town highway employees the other day that uh, a hedge on Winooski Street was going to be cut back because there's going to be new sidewalks going down Winooski Street. And I hope that's, that's good. But I think it's something we shouldn't forget. Some of us do get a little older each year, and uh, there are sidewalks, not just on Winooski Street, but other places as well, that definitely need some attention. So, no disrespect to Jane, she mentioned paving, but... Uh, no, I mentioned sidewalks. I mentioned sidewalks. Maybe you didn't well, hear me. My hearing aid wasn't working. Well. <laughs> anyway, that's, my, that's my concern, and I hope it gets addressed. Thank you. I think, Everett, there is, uh, is, there is talk about doing some sidewalk work on Winooski Street, if I'm correct. Um, so, we do our best. Um, I'll have the last word in this, I guess. Uh, sounds like the list of items here we got are uh, fairly substantial. Um, there's a way that we can put them down on paper and uh, maybe gel them down to a bottom line of list of priorities and uh, start with the leading priority and uh, schedule some time and whatever other information is needed to uh, address each one of those issues throughout the year and maybe Bill you can take the lead on that because as far as scheduling is concerned you probably have a better grasp on uh, what what would come first. And yeah well I think I appreciate your comment about prioritization. Um, you know, we started this discussion off by me saying that staff has this year's budget to execute. We've got our work plan. We're going to be doing uh, these kinds of things. Um, every, in the CIP budget, there's $35,000 for the sidewalks. There's probably a little more money in the on the highway budget itself, the, the, the operating budget. Um, it's, it's not any more than was budgeted last year in the CIP. Um, I hope to spend it all this year. We spent um, not quite 25,000 out of the 35,000 last year. Um, we spent less because we adjusted the, the job that we did. We didn't spend as much on the sidewalk down at the North Main Street um, area than we thought we would. Uh, we are looking at Winooski Street. Um, one of the things that I've talked about with the Public Works staff, uh, haven't really shared it with the, uh, with the select board completely yet, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, do, do all of our sidewalks need to be uh, five foot wide concrete sidewalks. Um, you know, uh, to me, there's many sidewalks, certainly on Main Street, we're going to want that to be a concrete sidewalk. But um, if we pulled the sidewalk blocks, and I'm not saying that we're going to do this, but if we pulled the sidewalk blocks out of Winooski Street and prepared that and made it five feet wide and then paved it with asphalt, um, the $35,000 that we have goes a lot further than if you have to put a concrete sidewalk in. So uh, we're trying to be creative with how we address these issues. Not every solution meets every application out there. So it's something that we'll be talking with the board as we go forward. But uh, we heard your concerns and take them seriously. Nobody wants bad sidewalks. Um, but we also know that it took a long time for the sidewalks to get in the condition they're in now, and they're not all going to be fixed immediately either. We just don't have that kind of money. So um, I hope that helps, but that's where we are right now. Well, I guess I look at it as more of an important priority than we're in it. What's about the right trail near the Little River? I. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree, and that's what the beauty of my job is, is trying to take all these interests that people have and figure out, you know, with the board's help. And it, Chris will tell you, I mean, I've had a number of conversations with him saying, you know, sometimes maybe the solution or part of the solution to the problem is 
something that somebody wants we say no to and we just take it off the table as opposed to funding it 15% of the way. Um, and that's a philosophical discussion that we have to have because, you know, the pie can grow in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can keep adding slices to the pie and trying to do more things. And if, if you don't want to spend any more money, all the slices get a little smaller. Or you have to say, we can't do everything that everybody wants, and that's a great idea, but we're not going to do that. So I think that's part of what Chris was just talking about with regard to prioritization. Um, so Carla has done a good job, I think, of taking down all of the information, all of the things that you've put out on the table. They'll be in the minutes. I think probably a next best step, maybe not next meeting, but for a, a meeting in the not too distant future is to say, okay, there's 12 things on this list. Which ones and how many can we tackle in a, in a year? So, so I can finish up here. Um, so having listened to what he just said, uh, I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, as a board member, I'm going to be pretty hard-nosed when it comes to talking about these issues. Uh, I'm going to want to see definitive information in front of me that proves that we can afford any of these things going forward. Because if we can't afford them, uh, I'm not about to ask the taxpayers for more money. This, I, I'm tired of living in, in a state that is overtaxed and has been overtaxed. Um, you know, there was a day back when I was younger where we lived within our means and or just plain did without. And uh, this issue of continuing to want more and more and more when we can't even maintain what we've got is just simply ridiculous. So um, that's why I would like to see, you know, step by step, go down through this priority list, get the information needed to make good judgment calls, uh, and continue to look ahead forward as to what issues that we're definitely going to be stuck with um, that we can't avoid that are going to cost us tax dollars. and. Uh, then we'll just have to make the calls, you know, as to how we want to prioritize our tax dollars and just see what we can do with it. Okay. All righty. Oh, next hot button issue. Uh, <laughs> considering the gun control resolution. And I think that's... Prior, did you? Yeah, I put it on the list to co the continuation from the town meeting. I didn't bring the resolution with me because I, I didn't. Have it. I got one here. So yeah. I was wondering if uh, we could read it and have a discussion. I think we owe it to the person that requested the resolution to discuss it. And um, I'm glad we started to have the conversation. I think it's important as a community that we address what's happening in the country. And um, yeah. Okay, well I have a, I just happened to print one off, um, brought it with me, so I, I'll read it aloud and uh, we can go from there. So, um, David, David Luce up Waterbury Center put this uh, referendum together for us to consider and uh, it starts by saying, whereas it is the duty of government to protect its citizens and whereas it has become clear that schools public facilities and victims of random domestic abuse are at risk of attack by known, unknown, known and unknown persons possessing legal or illegal firearms and ammunition and whereas it is essential to protect the school community at large from such threats and whereas Phil Scott, governor of Vermont and the Vermont legislative legislature are currently in negotiations to change the gun control laws of Vermont 
Now, therefore, we, the select board of the, for the town of Waterbury, at our meeting on March 19th, 2018, hereby resolve to request the governor and legislature to seek common ground with the intent result of strengthening the current gun control laws of Vermont so as to best protect all Vermont citizens from legal gun violence. Doesn't say legal, it just says from gun violence. From oh, gun I'm violence. sorry. Yeah, I don't know where I got that legal. <laughs> from gun violence. Okay. Comments? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I, I support the letter. I think it's not asking for specific changes to the gun laws, but I think it is important that we review where, you know, as we're requesting the state to continue to review the, the current gun laws in Vermont. Um, to be honest with you, I have a huge fear that we're a community, just like any other community, that could see violence like this. And it's scary to think that it could happen here. And I think that there are weapons that the general public can purchase that I don't believe they should be able to, just like I can't own a tank. I don't think that there's certain weapons that are necessarily used to protect as much as to assault. So I just think that I'm in support of, and I'm not asking, I don't think this letter is asking for the <coughs> removal of assault weapons or anything like that. I think it's just a request of pushing the government at the state level to take guns seriously and look at ways to protect our citizens and I'm in full support of that. I also am in support of it. I um, I think that it's a good letter. It's not prescriptive, um, but it's just showing support for taking action. I think we've been very fortunate in Vermont <clears throat> to have um, no gun violence in terms of um, in, in mass mass incidents. There certainly, as David pointed in his email today to the select board, there is gun violence occurring, um, but not. We, we've been fortunate not to have any mass shootings. I, I think we should not be complacent and think that it can't happen here. Um, I think that the governor has uh, shown some integrity, I think, in, in taking seriously what was potentially a, a dangerous situation in Fairhaven. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's, it's you know, it's, it's unfortunate to hear about these incidents and to know of it, somebody who's so troubled who would um, intend to harm others that they know in a school setting. So I think that um, we need to support the governor going out on a limb and being willing to take this seriously. And I think it's important for towns to let him know. I think we heard a lot at the town meeting that was also <clears throat> respectful and um, supporting this, this measure, so I'm in support of it. Matt, did you want to weigh in? Okay. Um, I'm in agreement with uh, Mark and Jane with respect to this. Um, it It's not um, portending to be an answer. Um, what it is is a, um, a, an emphasis by the town that we want the legislature and the governor to work together to reach um, reasonable conclusions on this issue. Uh, some of the proposals that have been offered um, deal with longstanding um, issues within the community that, that need to have some changes. Um, I thought the proposal was done in a thoughtful manner. The discussion that we had at town meeting, um, I would like to thank the moderator for uh, encouraging the discussion that did take place. He allowed for everyone to have their say on the matter. Um, unfortunately, it was not uh, found to be in proper order for any sort of resolution at that point. Um, however, I think it's within the bounds of this board to, um, uh, to speak to that issue. And I'm, I'm glad it's before us now. 
Uh, I, I too am in favor of it. Um, I think we're foolish to think this can't reach our community. Um, Speak into the mic a little more. I too am in favor of it. Um, I think we're foolish to think that this won't reach our community. Um, and I don't think that this gun control thing is a is a is a one step thing. Um, there are so many there are so many issues with um, obtaining these weapons that aren't that, that that can't be handled with with one bill. Um, you know, uh, you can you can buy an assault rifle in a Walmart parking lot, private sale from somebody who doesn't even need to give you their identity. Or you can buy it at a um, at a shop down the street. That's just one of the things. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but I know that we'd be foolish to not raise our voices and get the people who can make some decisions to keep our schools safe. Um, you know let their voices be heard and we should be in support of anything that can help i got one other thing to say it seems that the fed at the federal level um this um issue is not um getting any traction and i think it's it seems clear that it's up to the states to um by default to have to take some initiative. And I think um, that's why it's important also to speak up as a community and let the legislature know that we value some kind of movement on this issue and take it seriously. Well, Jane, you kind of uh, hit the point on the head. You said speak up for our community. Obviously, from town meeting, uh, you probably understand that I'm a staunch gun advocate, or st I'm an advocate for Second Amendment. Uh, I do understand everybody's concern. My problem was that um, this referendum was kind of pulled out of the back pocket of Mr. Luce late in the game um, we didn't have substantial time for feedback from a large amount of uh, the taxpayers in this town and it says clearly here now therefore we the select board for the town of Waterbury How, I, I don't, don't, not quite sure how you people can um, pass, make a judgment call on a, uh, on a referendum like this when you, quite honestly, probably haven't heard from the people of the town. Uh, there was a few people at town meeting that uh, the uh, organization of that subject was kind of a little convoluted because I think we were all over misunderstanding which was up for conversation here. Was it the moderator's call on uh, calling the motion or calling the request out of order, or was it the fact that we should or shouldn't have gun control? Um, I have four grandchildren, one of which is in school, and I have concerns about what's going on out there in society today. I actually uh, brought with me a uh, copy of a email that was sent to me from uh, a guy that pertains to uh, psychotropic drugs used um, that connected all the mass shootings, the, 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 the um, shooters, with some use of psychotropic drugs way back to the Columbine uh, incident and throughout. Um, I read through the article 
and then I read all the comments that preceded the article, and uh, I have this information. If you people would like to look at it, it's um, quite disturbing, quite interesting, and uh, you know, to me, proves that there's more to this problem than just the guns. Um, you know, my grandson came into my shop the other day and uh, looked at me and he said, hey, Grampy, he said, uh, I got hunting boots just like you. And he said, when I get older, bigger, he said, I want to go hunting and I want to have a gun and go hunting with you. And I looked down at him and I said to myself, maybe, we'll see. Um, this is a this is a big issue. You're you're right. There is no good answer at this point in time. Uh, I don't know how the board members feel about uh, whether or not you really think you should have more input from the members of the community, or if you're willing to just go ahead and sign this petition or this referendum um, without that information. Go ahead, Mark. I completely disagree that we don't have the voice of the community. We sit here on this board representing our community with every decision. We're voted by the community to take these positions and voice our support or on are not supporting specific issues. I think this is a great example of we're in the town meeting. I do agree that it came up out of turn. That's why I kind of did not speak during that point because I did feel like it wasn't necessarily appropriate for that part of the meeting. But now that it was warned, I think that if anyone feels like we did this justice, I feel like people need to get the community needs to be more involved in meetings and be more involved in the town government. Um, I feel str I don't sit here and say that I, this is just my own opinion. I also regularly interact with people in this community and I listen and I have thoughtful discussion. So I feel like some of the comments that were made are saying that I don't and I that's upsetting to me because I am not just one voice. I try to represent my community when I sit here in this seat, and I think that's important for other board members to understand and know. Um, and yeah, that's where I, I leave it. But when I say that I support this letter, I'm not just speaking for myself. I understand the decision that I make when I do that is that I am trying to represent my community as best as possible. I'd say that at the town meeting, most of the comments were in support of this resolution or in, in support of some, some action. Um, people seem to be very concerned about gun violence. I don't think that by, um, so I take that, well, I think people didn't vote necessarily to sustain or overrule so that the, um, the statement could be sent and endorsed at the town meeting, I still felt like the um, <clears throat> what I heard was pretty clearly that a lot of people were very concerned and would like some sort of statement sent. Um, so I, I don't think this has anything to do with hunting. Hunting in our state is a, you know, tradition and, and well respected and it's just part of our uh, part of living here and I, I don't think this has anything to do with that. I'd also like to say that I support the Second Amendment and I support hunting in this state. Chris, just for a point of information, um, the Carla leaned over and just told me that when Mark asked for this to be on the agenda tonight, of course, the wording that uh, was presented at town meeting talked about the town, and this talks about the select board. So Carla had to wordsmith a little bit, and where it says, now, therefore, we, the select board for the town of Waterbury, it could just as easily say the select board of the town of Waterbury. So if there's, you know, I'm not 
speaking for or against whether you want to do anything, but if it's not worded exactly right, you can change that as well. But Carla just did try to capture the essence of what Mr. Luce had presented and amended it for the select board's consideration. So we just thought you should know that. So Mark, I'm not denying the fact that you, uh, you know, talk to people in the town, but um, let's face it, we all have our certain groups of people that we tend to either hang out with or see. So to get a broad perspective of how the community feels as a whole, I think uh, just on an everyday occurrence is pretty tough to do, especially with something like this. Um, the fact that our legislative body up at the State House is entertaining a fair amount of discussion pertaining to this issue, uh, and as well as the governor has commented on it, um, to, with such short notice, expect without any special public meeting uh, to hear from the, the, our constituents, uh, I don't know, it just, it makes it tough for me to uh, understand how you, how anybody here sitting on this board can have a good feel for how their community feels about it. Obviously, uh, anybody, <laughs> uh, anybody in their right mind would want this type of crime to stop. Absolutely. Um, but nobody seems to have the good answer. So. I, um, <clears throat> I've followed this um, fairly closely. The discussions that are taking place um, at the State House regarding this issue um, is the standard legislative process. There are a lot of ideas that go in. There's a lot of discussion that takes place. And whether or not they'll actually achieve any sort of consensus is still anyone's guess. The, my reading of this resolution is that it's, it's really asking the governor and our legislators to work together <clears throat> to reach a reasonable conclusion. And with that in mind, I guess I would offer a, a motion that we as a board uh, approve this resolution and forward it to the governor and the legislature. I'll second. Okay, a motion's been made and seconded. Good. Yes, sir. One more. Um, as a public person, like the Lone Ranger, uh, I don't miss many meetings, and I have tried and tried to get people out. I've talked to people recently since town meeting. I wasn't there at the end of the town meeting because I certainly had something to say. I do believe in the Second Amendment. I'm a hunter for over 60 years, as you are. Uh, you've got situations in schools, unfortunately, where the, the mental health issues are not being addressed as well as they should be. And I'm not pointing the finger at any particular school, but that's the case. And thank God that the Fairhaven situation did get to the public. Uh, that young man, I believe, had been in Maine and a twice uh, for mental health help. help. <coughs> Sorry about that. I should have gone up to the mic. Uh, backing up a little bit just to support Chris's philosophy. We all want our communities to be safe. I think it was a manipulation on the part of the presenter to do it at the end of the meeting. I wish I had been there, but due to family circumstances, I was not able to be there. But uh, I would strongly encourage more input from people in our town. Yes, Mark, you're, you're right to some degree. You do represent the people, you talk to people, I do as well. Billing Global, the Maple Woods and so forth are places of conversation for various people. But I would hope that you would give it more serious thought before you approve this motion tonight and either do something on the website with a poll, uh, people's opinion, some manner of getting to as many people as possible in that community before you as a select board send this forward. I just don't think it's the right thing to do. 
having served as a trustee for 20 years, um, it's difficult sometimes to satisfy everybody with no question. But I would encourage you to really take a hard thinking session on approving this tonight. I think it's too quick and not enough input has been put into it from the community. And you only had, what, 40 or 50 people at town meeting at that time. So it's a very low percentage of all the people that were there. So with that said, I would encourage you to vote down the motion and do some form of community input before you actually forward this to the governor. And I know he is working on it very sincerely and concerned. Yep. I know that personally. Yep. Thank you. So a motion's been made and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion? Yes. Yes, Alec. Uh, Alex Collin. Um, I just want to say, it seems like now's the time um, to encourage the legislature, the legislature to delve into this more, which I think they obviously are now. Um, I actually, believe it or not, come from a family of hunting guides, so I'm kind of used to family members actually having guns, but it's about, for them, it's about access. And I think that's what they're also discussing at the state level. Um, I think anything that we can do to encourage the state legislators simply to look into the items, um, I think that would be the way to go. Now's the time, if we keep on putting it off, um, you know, they're not going to get that encouragement from us. Um, that's my two bits. Thanks. I would agree. And I think, um, I don't know. I, yeah, there were 50 people, 60, 70 people at the end of the town meeting, but certainly it seemed to me the prevalent voice in the room was to support an amendment like this, not oppose it. And it, I don't think this has to do with this, I, I don't think it has to do with hunting. With all due respect, the Second Amendment, in my opinion, is about arming a, a militia that goes back to that time in our, in our country when the, the states were just becoming organized after being ruled by England. So without going down that path, um, I disagree on that. I, I just, I, I support um, signing the amendment, and I think the time is right to do it. So it seemed that it seemed that this uh, referendum came f forward kind of on the eleventh hour. Um, you know, it's everybody's right to uh, call their state legislators and voice their opinion on how they feel about this bill or this issue that's going through the state house. And I'll be quite honest with you: for Dave Luce to bring this to the town meeting like he did when you've got a state legislative body already up to their neck in the weeds on this thing, to me didn't, could have the potential to do nothing more than drive a wedge between our legislative body and the way the community members feel or could feel on either side about this issue. So the way I'm looking at it, the board hasn't had ample time to bring it to its community to get a reaction from them and get, you, you said you heard what you felt was a majority. There was no indication that there was a majority for or against this thing. There was no uh, vote, uh, there was no... Um, Most of the comments that I heard were in favor of this resolution. There were only a few that were opposed. People were, seemed to be on the fence about whether you should overrule the moderator that way, but in my opinion, most of the people in the room were in favor of this. Okay, until we have a defined vote that states that, I don't know how anybody can sit up on this board and say, yes, we're representing our community members. Well, with all due respect, I think the way that this is written is it's our call. So I'm in favor of passing it. And I disagree with what you're saying. Okay. So motion's been made and seconded. Um, if there's any further discussion from anybody, take a vote. 
All those in favor of uh, passing this referendum and signing it and sending it to the State House, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Nay. <coughs> To sign it. Well, this is the original one here, I guess. You see to it that the minutes reflect the reason I voted uh, no on this was because I felt like the community yep. didn't have time enough to have ample input. Got it. Okay. It's a tad bit past 810, but we'll go on to manager's items. Right. Thank you. Uh, I won't take very long tonight, even though there's uh, four items here. The first item is uh, the annual certificate of highway mileage that we have to file with the uh, Agency of Transportation for the year ending February 10th. So again, here's another annual thing with an arbitrary date, February 10th, 2018. Um, <clears throat> We have to uh, sign this, and what you're certifying is that the town will comply with the state statute that says municipalities must spend a sum of at least $300 per mile for our highways. We have uh, about 50 miles of highway, and we spend $1.6 million on it. It's about $28,000 a mile. so we meet the requirements of the law. Uh, we have to file this annual financial plan. The only time the state really ever uses it is when there's a disaster. It doesn't have to be an Irene level disaster, but a declared disaster where FEMA gets involved. And if, if you've certified that you have spent at least $300 per mile, and explain how you spend your money, uh, they'll make sure that you're eligible for grant funding. So um, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's uh, two forms to sign. Uh, I would appreciate if you would make a motion to uh, approve and sign the certificate of highway mileage and the annual financial plan for town highways. So moved. I'll second that. <clears throat> okay, motion has been made to move, moved and seconded to uh, approve the certificate of highway mileage and annual financial plan for town highway. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> There's two places to sign. Uh, I think the second page of the one that's stapled and the bottom of the page that's in your right hand, Mark. Right. Okay, we get this one here. Yep. And then the bottom of that other page there, I believe. Yeah, it looks like it's got three slots. You can squeeze in all the names. Sign them all. <clears throat> While you're signing that, I can continue on, Chris? Sure. OK. Um, so letters B and C are uh, items on my list of things that the board needs to get done. Um, the traffic ordinance, uh, we, back last fall, I presented a draft traffic ordinance to the board. Um, uh, Mark pointed out that it looked like it was in good shape, except it did not list where all of the street, uh, where all of the stop signs are outside of the village. So um, that I've been around the roads, I've identified where all the stop signs are, um, and I'm in the process of incorporating them. That list is going to be very long now, but it's all there. Um, 
we want to have the traffic ordinance adopted by the select board uh, at probably uh, one of its meetings in April. Um, for your information, uh, the process of adopting an ordinance uh, requires that the board puts the fact that they're going to consider an ordinance on their agenda. Uh, it does not require a public hearing. The board can adopt the ordinance. And once the ordinance is adopted, um, it's effective on the 61st day after adoption unless a, a petition is circulated to have a town meeting to overturn the, the desires of the select board. So um, our Mark and I are meeting tomorrow with uh, folks from the state police to begin talking about the, the contract for the um, uh, service contract that we approved at the special town meeting in January. That contract is supposed to go into effect on July 1st. We want to have this traffic ordinance in place by at least July 1st. The village ordinance, which uh, is still in effect now, and the state police are, uh, they have been out enforcing uh, speed limits and, and the like, but we want to make sure that the town's ordinance is in place for July 1st. So we'll, I'm not sure I'll have it on the April 2nd meeting, but uh, certainly by the second meeting in April, we'll be set to present that. And if it gets adopted, I presume it won't be petitioned and it will be effective uh, for the 1st of July. Um, the personnel policy, um, some of the board members have been around long enough to remember that we discussed this policy with the trustees, uh, had some assistance from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns incorporating the new Family Leave Act requirements in particular into the ordinance and making sure it's up to date with current state law. Um, and it's almost ready to go. There's a little bit of tweaking that needs to be done with regard to how we're going to talk about leave policy. We won't, don't need to get into that tonight. Um, a conscious decision was made uh, last fall because the village was uh, getting ready to go out of existence and getting ready to um, uh, disband its police department as of the first of the year, uh, the trustees felt it was probably better just to continue living with the personnel policy that was in place. Uh, again, that for your benefit, um, I manage uh, the town and the village. There's five elected boards that I staff and report to. Um, while there's no requirement that the village's personnel policy be exactly the same as the town's personnel policy, it's something that staff has recommended. I try to, uh, to encourage, well, I direct my staff from me down to, we try to consider ourselves one organization that's just trying to provide the public services that the community has asked for. Uh, gets paid for out of di different pockets, and there's a different board that ultimately is in control. But uh, we have had, since the early 80s, a unified personnel policy. And I want to continue that. Uh, the village won't have any employees. Well, the village doesn't have any employees right now except for water and sewer employees. And once the new utility district comes into play on July 1st, the village won't exist anymore as the village. It will simply be the utility district. So um, the personnel policy I recommend will, I, I hope, will be adopted by the select board for the town and the um, utility district commissioners for the utility district. So. We'll probably have some joint meetings. Uh, the, the utility district won't be formed until July 1st. It's possible, I suppose, we could adopt the ordinance and have the village trustees and the water sewer commissioners adopt it. Ultimately, I think it would be better 
for the utility district itself to adopt it. So I'll be bringing this to the to the board for discussion, um, and it will probably be in joint session with whichever other board July is August. there. So yeah, I'd probably like to get it maybe out there and discussed so we can maybe um, review the, the sections that are being fine-tuned and make sure the boards don't have any concerns or problems with it and then right after the first of the year I mean the first of July I think it'd like it to be adopted if at all possible any questions about that okay and then the board orientation again that um, uh, I think you told me that you're, you're not able to attend the VLCT select board not this, uh, institute not this, no. okay that's that's fine uh, they run it every year and I would encourage you if you can uh, to attend um, <clears throat> there are numerous trainings throughout the year that VLCT does provide um, even that select board institute I've never been to it um, I think it's mostly geared to towns where the there are no town managers um, the town manager form of government uh, uh, shifts the authority for many of the provisions in state statute that enable the select board to do certain things. It gives that authority to the town manager. Uh, I know Mark and Chris have been in the past. They probably touch on town manager a little bit in that institute. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good uh, shotgun of select board duties that what was helpful for me last time was they, they had segments on uh, quasi-judicial proceedings and everything, and we were rolling into the Main Street project, so it was good familiarity with something that I hadn't had any exposure to, but they, they do a pretty good job with that. There are a number of different segments that you can go to. And right. So even though you're not able to go to that training that's going to be sometime soon, um, there is money in the budget for training. If there's anything that comes across your uh, email from VLCT and you're interested in, just let me know. We'll sign you up. We pay for you to go. Uh, and then um, during the course of the year, and probably starting with the next several meetings, I'll try to put one or two items on the agenda just to kind of bring you up to speed with certain things that we have here some things you probably have some familiarity with. I'll probably, usually once a year, I talk about the town's investment policies. We have uh, on, uh, a lot of money now in, in a various funds that uh, we're invested in. Um, and, and if there's anything else that you want to know about, let me know, and I'll try to get it on an agenda and you know do a little bit of uh, refresh your coursework for the rest of the board. So that's it. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Oh, shoot. Did you, did you vote on that yet? We get a motion and second. Is there further, We're in a discussion. Is there further discussion? So uh, one thing that has happened, and this is a relatively new development, um, we have our, our books audited every year. Um, and for as long as I've been here, Bill Iacoboni, uh, CPA who hangs out his own shingle, has been doing our audit work, both for the town and the village. He's a very good auditor and has uh, done a lot of good work with us. Um, <clears throat> he's also very reasonable in his prices. And uh, we budgeted this year um, for the town uh, not too much money. Um, we budgeted $10,000 for the commercial audit this year. We spent $8,500 last year for it. Um, Mr. Iacoboni has informed me that he will not be able to do audits going forward for the town. Um, it has to do with uh, peer review requirements and continuing education. Um, Bill used to do a lot of uh, 
governmental audit work. He had a number of town and school clients uh, over the past um, half dozen years or so. He has been downsizing that practice. And um, the long and short of it is, is that in order to do our audit, he would have to do a whole section of continuing education for, for government auditing and we're his only client now and he can't justify the amount of money that it would cost him and the time that will take him because he has other continuing ed requirements for his license. Um, I, I asked him, I said, can't we just, you know, one last one, it would be nice for him to close out, the, be nice for him to close out the village, yeah. you know. Um, and I saw him uh, last week and he said that he looked at the rules every way he could and, you know, with with good conscience and and honesty, he, he can't do it. So um, I will be probably putting this out to bid. I'll probably solicit bids from three or four auditing firms that I'm aware of. Um, the downside to that is any time that somebody new comes in to audit, they've got to do some work with the old audit reports and do some baseline investigation, it's going to cost more than the $10,000 we have budgeted. Um, we're not required to do the audit. I wouldn't recommend not doing it, uh, but um, our last audit was of our 2016 year. Our 2017 year just ended. Typically, Yacovoni has done our field work in July and gets an audit report out in September. Um, there's not a law that requires us to have an audit. It is a good best practice, however. Um, if we received more than uh, $750,000 of federal grant money, we, we are required to do what's called a single audit. Uh, we did not receive anywhere close to that amount of money last year in the town or village. The last year that we did was on the roundabout project um, and then some of the projects that involved this building. Um, but I think we should do the audit. So I'll be putting out some uh, requests for proposals and I'll be bringing those back to you and then we'll make the decision. But I just want to let you know that uh, Mr. Iacoboni isn't going to be able to do it. and. Uh, that was news to me right around the time the budget was going to print. So, Bill, did you uh, have any sense of what it might cost us in the future? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to speculate okay. yet. Okay. I didn't know if you yeah. maybe uh, found some. I, I haven't. Information on yeah. okay. I have a suspicion, but I don't want to officially <laughs> say. You don't want to tell it to us this late at night. Huh? <laughs> okay, motion been made uh, to adjourn and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.